Directors at the Wine Society. Uh, very kindly, I've been told the meeting is now streaming on YouTube. The reason I'm telling you that in particular for these events is we are in meeting format. Now, some of you have kindly got your recording is in progress. There we go. Uh, some of you have kindly got your cameras on. Like I said, that's absolutely lovely. Um, we, you won't be recorded onto YouTube or onto the recording unless you unmute yourself. So the way that we do uh, these particular events is only the speaker is recorded. So if you have a moment of madness and you unmute yourself, then be warned, you will potentially be a YouTube celebrity by the end of the evening. Uh, but we might have opportunity to have the actual uh, proper unmuting. So having a nice uh, little Q&A at the end as well. Uh, so as I mentioned, yes, you are uh, muted and we will be keeping you on mute. It's just so that everyone can, can listen along and hear it to the best of their ability. Um, and yes, don't worry if you, you do, if you don't want to put your camera on, it's certainly not compulsory. Uh, but what I will say is you can view this event in two different ways. So you can view as, as our team do, which is the speaker view, that's how we record, or you can view all the other members uh, sat enjoying their Merlot or other at home. Um, most laptops, it will be in the top left or right corner. Uh, TV screens, again, slightly different, uh, but phones and tablets is swiping left to right. Uh, when I show a PowerPoint in a, in a little, well, just a few moments, actually, uh, when I do show a PowerPoint in a few moments, uh, you'll have the option to see how many other cameras are on. Uh, you're welcome to select however many cameras you like. Um, but anyway, without further ado, conscious of time, uh, for those new to the SIP size sessions, welcome. Um, apologies if you couldn't join last week due to our technical crisis, but thank goodness it's been resolved. So I can already see we have 117 Merlot fans or, or maybe even Merlot newbies joining us tonight. Um, SIP size events are just 45 minutes and they are designed to be a little play on bite size. They're hopefully going to be fun uh, and pitched at different levels so that you can use them like building blocks on your wine journey. Uh, this is an introduction to Merlot. So this is great for beginners, but also really good for people who just want to solidify some knowledge, maybe uh, recap a little bit and also taste some wines as well. Now, uh, some of you who are more regular watchers may spot that I'm not in my normal place of recording, and that's because I'm actually out doing a harvest uh, in uh, the Southern Rhone at the moment and doing all of the events and the event work alongside it. So it's long days and uh, very dirty. I've spent a long time cleaning my nails, but today we were processing Grenache. Mm -hmm. And actually Grenache is um, in many ways a similar partner to um, Bordeaux. So Grenache gives to a Rhone blend in some ways uh, what, uh, sorry, a Merlot gives to a Bordeaux. And I'll go on to that in a little bit, but by and large, um, Merlot is much like Grenache in that it is a friendly, great variety. It's a great variety that lots of people love. It's very easy to love. And so it's my pleasure this evening to talk about it because, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Contrary to something we'll talk about a bit later, which was a certain movie, I don't believe that you can hate Merlot. So uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the evening and whether you're drinking the three wines I've recommended or Merlot of your own or any other wine, I do hope you have a nice evening. So please feel free to dig into wine one. The uh, I've got the uh, Belle Air Père Ponche. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Um, but you can you can taste along whilst I just give you a tiny bit of background into the great variety Merlot. So uh, Merlot is, I say a new variety, what a silly thing to say, but it's relatively new in the grand scheme of things. We first hear about Merlot written down in the latter half of the 18th century. So um, a more modern, I suppose, great variety is one way of looking at it. The name itself derives from Merle or Merlou, uh, which is a local dialect translation of Blackbird. Um, and I think if you look at any of the Merlots that you have, unless they're sort of 50, 60 years old, most of them will have this gorgeous raven Blackbird colour. So hardly surprising that a, a local dialect decided to name the great Merlot. Um, now, 
In terms of lineage, parentage, it is a child. Uh, so it's it's great parents. Uh, Cabernet Franc, which we also see lots of in Bordeaux, and there are plenty of similarities, particularly the herbaceous notes that we'll, we'll explore shortly. Um, and a very obscure variety that if you have tried a a single uh, wine variety of this grape variety, you will be in probably, I don't even, I've never met anyone who has, but it's called Magdalene Noir de Chantore, Chorante. Um, but what's most important is those two bedfellows, uh, Cabernet Franc and Magdalene, have also produced Cabernet Sauvignon. So Merlot is actually related to Cabernet Sauvignon. And again, I mentioned earlier, in Bordeaux, those two blend really beautifully together. And they're siblings. So uh, we'll talk a bit about what they bring to the table shortly. Uh, but it's it's a very much um, a group of grapes that are related to one another, have great similarities, but great differences, and go into some of the most famous blended wines in the world. So I'm going to start the very short uh, little bits of presentation, but I do have uh, those of you who were here on our Pinot session last week, um, you may recognize some of these little uh, photographs. But essentially, I think it's a really good idea before we crack into where in the world Merlot is grown, let's actually talk about what it smells and tastes like. Um, I'm going to use my Bordeaux, but feel free to use any wine you like. And if you don't have a wine, I'm sure you can use the powers of imagination as we go through some of these. Um, generally, there are similarities between Merlot and Cabernet. And some of the things you'd look at here that are similar are things like black cherries, um, cassis. So I couldn't find a picture of cassis. You'll have to excuse the rather crude um, it's cassis sorbet in the top part of your screen. Um, you also find similarities to Cab Franc. I mentioned the herbaceousness earlier, so that green sort of flavour. Um, you also get more red fruits uh, than perhaps the two Cabernets give you uh, as much of. So things like red plums, black plums as well, mind you, but red cherry and red currants as well. So Hopefully, whatever Merlot or whichever Merlot you have in your glass, you might be able to pick up some of those red fruits, black fruits, herby notes, cassis, and um, I've actually popped olives on there as well, because some uh, more complex Merlots, shall we say, particularly cooler climate ones, uh, tend to have a bit of an olive twang to them as well. Now... If you have an oak aged wine, mine isn't oak aged. So if you're drinking along with me, uh, the uh, Bel Air Per Ponchet is not uh, aged in oak. So you shouldn't get any of these flavours in theory. But if you move along the page to the next cluster, we have got uh, lots of luscious and lovely things. And Merlot is a great, great variety for oak. In particular, Again, if you're tasting along with me or you have an oaked one, uh, the, the third wine, we're going to come back and see some of these. But things like um, vanilla from American oak, chocolate, lovely, coffee. Um, you can get coconut. It really does take on a lot of vanilla flavours. And one of the reasons it, it sorry, a lot of oak flavours. And one of the reasons it's such a good grape variety for taking on oak is it has a lovely structure where it's this sort of smooth, mellow, um, the tannins aren't too, pardon me, aren't too high. You get what a lot of people describe as luscious and it's got a really, really luscious body to it. And for me, that's one of the reasons that oak works so well. It can be a really indulgent wine. And then last but not least, at the bottom of your page, you have some smells and aromas and tastes, but I would argue not all of them. Um, believe me, there are plenty more, but I've only got one screen to give you an overview. Um, but Merlot can age and the really good ones age for a long time. And you tend to get more savoury things. So we saw in Pinot some mushroom. We're going to get that again, possibly, but also the earthy aromas. And one thing that's really quite um, special about Merlot and, and really lovely about this great variety is it gets quite a famous smell. Now, I really, I don't know whether you can even tell me what, what that is at the bottom there, but it's actually a cigar box. 
And when I first joined the wine trade, I thought, what on earth is somebody doing describing a cigar box as a wine smell? Um, but a good Bordeaux, an aged Bordeaux does tend to have this sort of mixture. And I'll try and break it down. If you've not smelt a box of cigars before, maybe you haven't lived. No, but um, I don't make a habit of going around smelling cigar boxes. But for me, a cigar box smell is a combination of sort of wood, maybe like the sweet uh, papers, smoky tobacco. It's this sort of lovely amalgamation of earthy, sweet, savoury. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's a lovely thing. Strange, but uh, a strange one, but lovely. Uh, so there are some of the aromas and the tastes. I would be really keen if you are, if you're up for it, to write in the chat and tell me if you're picking out any of those in your Merlot. Um, for me, if you are drinking along or if you have, have a sort of entry level or a, an everyday Bordeaux, I get lots of red and black fruits in this. I do get those sorts of herbs, maybe some dried thyme, all of that kind of thing. Um, I am getting a little touch of age. I've got a 2018, so I'm certainly sensing a tiny bit of something more earthy. But overall, a really lovely fruity, um, yeah, very pleasant wine on the aromas. Um, I will tell you a little bit about the structure, because with Merlot, that's really important. Um, essentially, uh, I mentioned it's a really good bedfellow for Cabernet. And one of the reasons is it's it sort of fills in what the things that Cabernet sometimes can't do. So a lot of people are a bit disparaging about Merlot and call it Mr. Medium or even worse, Mr. Average. I don't really mind Mr. Even, uh, medium, but Mr. Average sounds sounds negative. I certainly don't mean this in a negative way, but it does hit often the medium points on everything. So medium acidity, whereas Cabernet would be very high, it's sort of medium and it makes the wine a bit more approachable. We've got um, medium uh, tannins. Again, I mentioned those tannins are really soft and the mouthfeel is very gentle. Something like a, a gutsy new Cabernet would have really high tannins. So it sort of tempers the tannins slightly. So more medium tannins, more medium acidity. Alcohol can can creep up a bit, so I'd be inclined not to call it a medium alcohol, but certainly a sort of medium body um, as well. So I do not mean medium as disparaging. And, and a lot of people say Merlot is almost a jack of all trades, master of none. I think, again, I think the master of none is the nasty bit uh, because actually it, it is a um, fabulous wine when made properly. Um, the last thing I'll say on that point is, is that little bit about being misunderstood, because this leads us really nicely on to talk about where in France this has grown and Merlot as a famous grape variety. Merlot actually produces some of the most expensive wines in the world. Now, um, you might think of Merlot, it's an easy drinker. It's a, it's a sort of everyday wine. Certainly can be. But uh, Chateau Petrus, uh, which is one of the most expensive wines in the world, is actually 90% uh, Merlot. And in 2011, there was an auction at Christie's. And hold on to your hats and your seats here, ladies and gents, because there was an auction at Christie's and they sold a very good vintage of 1961 Chateau Petrus. Uh, and it was sold for $144,000. One case. Uh, I actually think, and I don't know whether it's an old wives' tale, I think it was only 11 bottles. But even if it was 12 bottles, that means that it sold for $12,000 a bottle. So now you can understand why I have a bit of an issue with calling it a Mr. Average or a Mr. Medium. Uh, because when made properly, beautifully, well, and at a very high level, Merlot makes some of the best wines in the world. So it's not to be sniffed at. So that leads us really nicely on to where is, Bo uh, where is Bordeaux? I'm going to tell you where Bordeaux is, but where is Merlot grown around the world? So we're going to start in France uh, because that is the heartland, uh, as, ma as many grapes are, but this in particular has definitely got its feet firmly planted in France. 
Uh, I'm hoping that I'll be able to just show you a little laser pointer. Here we go. So we're going to be talking in our first wine about Bordeaux, this light green section here. But it's worth mentioning, and I'll I'll, um, go on to it after we've talked about that wine. This dark green area here was also really, really fantastic Bordeaux territory. And then also escaping down to the longer dock as well. Um, And even the Roussillon, you start to get really smart Bordeaux. Um, Sorry, Merlot. (laughs) What I would say is you'll notice those are all quite southerly. Merlot does need quite a decent temperature to ripen. So we're not going to be growing Merlot up here really in Alsace. We're not going to be growing it up here in Champagne. So it's a great variety that needs a little bit of sunshine and a little bit of heat, not too much, um, but just the right amount. Uh, So if you're looking for places around the world that grow it, uh, then certainly you do need a bit of sunshine and warmth. So... Let's go on to this wine because <clears throat> this particular wine, the Bel Air Per Pencher, is grown in Bordeaux. Uh, it's a reserve, uh, which means not a, oh, it's one of those misnomers. Um, it actually means the grapes were riper and there's therefore a slightly elevated alcohol in a good way. It means they achieved full ripeness. Um, and so this particular wine, very, very good value Bordeaux. Um, it is a, Uh, 85% Merlot and the other 15% is Cabernet Sauvignon. And I will tell you that because I'm now just going to quickly show you why that is important. So this particular wine, uh, being 85% Merlot, is can be more likely from one of the following areas. So it's, it's not, but it could be from this lower Madoc area or it could be from what we call the right bank. Now, this is actually from this central area here from Entre de Mer, which is not unusual by any stretch. But if you were getting a sort of Merlot dominant blend in a Bordeaux, the two places you might immediately think of were this lower Madoc area or base Madoc or the right bank. And the reason I'm telling you that is that very extensive wine that I just mentioned comes from this right bank area. On the right bank, they have very different soils. They have this sort of dense clay. And I've just mentioned that uh, Merlot, sorry, I'll just stop sharing. Just mentioned Merlot likes a bit of heat. Um, And also it ripens a little bit earlier than Cabernet Sauvignon. So actually, It's much, I don't want to say easier to grow, but it's certainly less challenging. Um, On the left bank, conversely, on the opposite side where I just showed you, below the little red patch was uh, the Medoc, where you may have heard of some more sort of other famous appellations like Margot, and Cabernet is king there. So if you flip uh, the percentages around the other way, you'll have Cabernet as the main focus and Merlot often playing second fiddle. Now, the reason there is that there's these gravelly soils and they're very well draining and Cabernet doesn't like to sit with its roots in in water. But Merlot absolutely doesn't mind and um, will happily live in those clay soils and that sort of dampness that Cabernet hates. But why is that important? Well, first of all, we've just proved uh, by me explaining on the right bank that the the Merlot dominant wines still fetch an enormous price. But not just that. Why blend at all in Bordeaux? Why would you not just make right bank wines that were Merlot and left bank wines that were Cabernet? Well, Bordeaux has a, um, sorry, right bank, you know what I mean. (laughs) I was trying to do my hand signals the wrong way around, like an air hostess, and I got myself confused. Left bank wines that were Cabernet and right bank wines that were Merlot. Um, you could, and absolutely, that you know that would be something that feasibly you could do. But the main reason for blending in Bordeaux, <clears throat> um, not only are they very complementary grape varieties, along with others like Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot that tend to add a little bit uh, of the lower percentages, But also Merlot is almost the world's best insurance policy. When your Cabernet has not ripened fully or you have some plots that are okay and some plots aren't, Merlot is such a wonderful grape variety to plump up your wine, to add this beautiful body, gorgeous flavors. So you don't really lose anything, but you you can certainly produce a wine in any year so long as that you have 
uh, that little bit of Merlot insurance policy. So for me, that makes Merlot almost the star of Bordeaux because without it, uh, we really would struggle to make consistent wine every year. Um, if you're drinking a, a sort of everyday Bordeaux that just says uh, a Bordeaux or a Bordeaux Reserve, as I've said here, you will tend to find that because of what I've just said, they're mainly Merlot. So uh, producers will have a huge insurance policy section of Merlot. And if they don't need it, then they'll produce these gorgeous, easy drinking, often slightly drinking younger wines as well. Um, and quite frankly, because it's easier to grow, it's much cheaper as well. You're not you're not putting all your eggs into a very, very dangerous basket. Uh, so the two main points on the right bank, and I'm just going to show you them really briefly because we can do, we'll do an introduction to Bordeaux. I think I've already popped it on the website, so we won't go into too much detail, but I will just show you the ones that you will probably have heard of because those are, and you'll have to excuse me because I'm doing, I'm managing two things at once. Uh, but we've got Pomerol. So for those that can see the cursor there, not to be confused with Lalande de Pomerol. Um, if you spot them, they are different prices and they're different prices for a reason. Pomerol is the main one and certainly the, uh, the oh, I hate to say better, but it, <laughs> it is unfortunately the better of the two. And then you have saint Emilion in the pink. Uh, two slightly different styles. Um, they are Mer both Merlot based, though, and tend to have Cabernet Franc supporting rather than Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, Pomerol, when it ages, tends to be quite meaty, dense, great with sort of uh, Sunday roasts, uh, whereas Saint, Saint Emilion tends to be a little leaner and more herbaceous. So, oops, sorry, I'm trying to stop share, but it's not working. Uh, bear with me just a moment. Sorry about that. Um, so, yes, that is Bordeaux in a nutshell. Um, I won't go too much into the producer details, but it is uh, this particular wine is produced by a company called Despange. Uh, they have six Bordeaux properties. And this particular uh, wine, as I mentioned, comes from the Entre de Mer between two seas. So it's a great um, everyday drinking Bordeaux. It's a lighter unoaked version, but they do make more expensive oaked versions as well. So please do seek them out, the Despange family. Um, I sort of did a tasting note earlier, so I won't dwell on it too much, but you are getting uh, a lot of red fruits, black fruits in that. And I really do get that herbaceous thing. So yeah, lovely. I've mentioned where else in France it's grown. Um, the Southwest I mentioned in particular um, of importance, and that is uh, particularly in Cahors, where it's blended with Malbec, and also in Bergerac, where they do something similar as well. So a different blending partner, but still a strong, strong-footed blending partner, where the Merlot sort of softens and makes it uh, uh, certainly not a lighter style, but perhaps a more a sort of friendlier style. Uh, in other parts of Europe, you've got Northeast Italy, particularly in a place called Frugli, um, where it can make quite plump, plump wines. Uh, Veneto, where it makes very easy drinking styles. But perhaps most um, famously, it goes into uh, other wine styles called Super Tuscans. Surprise, surprise, they are in Tuscany. Um, and what tends to happen with Super Tuscans um, is they are Sangiovese, the local Italian grape variety. And in the 80s, they, they decided to rip up the rule book about what you were allowed to do in Tuscany and blend with Bordeaux varietals. And a lot of people believe that the super Tuscans that are Merlot dominant are actually the best. So um, there's a huge sort of um, excitement, should I say, around Sangiovese and Merlot blended together in Tuscany. Uh, they're not cheap. So sadly, um, they're not the, that easy to get hands on either, but certainly not the easiest on the purse strings, uh, whereas those in Fruy and Benito certainly are. Uh, Southern Hemisphere, I'll whip through a couple because uh, then we are going to visit Chile. Um, Australia, they tend to make Bordeaux blends. Um, so what, exactly what we've just covered, where Cabernet often is the king, particularly in Margaret River, um, but Cabernet, Merlot, sometimes Cab Franc, um, and Margaret River, <coughs> pardon me, and McLaren Vale are the two really good hotspots if you want to look out for good Bordeaux blends in Australia. Likewise, New Zealand, 
Bordeaux blends again, uh, and Hawke's Bay, generally Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland is where you're going to find that warmer temperature to get those blends um, fully ripe. Um, and then lastly, but not leastly, I want to mention South Africa before we go on to Chile, because I would say out of all the New World um, or Southern Hemisphere New World producing countries, um, South Africa is probably the only one that's really flying a bit of a flag for Merlot by itself. Um, they are proving that you can make incredibly fine wine examples of Merlot that are not breaking the bank, particularly around the Stellenbosch area, um, often oaked, um, sometimes blended and make it made into a cake blend with things like Pinotage. But there are really, really decent examples of um, solitary Merlot. So if you decide you quite like a sort of New World Merlot style and that richer red fruits, then please do explore some wines of South Africa because I can't can't bang on about them enough. So without further ado, if you're tasting along, I'm going to have some of the Lascar Merlot. Um, so we're going to be visiting virtually Chile now. Um, much like Bordeaux, the range of Merlot and the quality levels is incredibly broad. Um, but very kindly, the price point matches it in Chile. And you can buy some ridiculously affordable Merlot here. Um, the Central Valley, where this wine is from, tends to be the easiest drinking. Um, and I'll show you a map in just a moment. But the, the Central Valley does tend to have a sort of larger flatter area where you can produce wines at, at large uh, quantities and often at great prices for that reason. So I'll just skip to the map if it's all right. So the Central Valley running down here, but if you do want to look for some more, um, I hasten to say finer styles, but some more sort of um, Friday night wines rather than Tuesday night wines, um, then there are a few places that I would recommend looking. Uh, Maipo tends to be <clears throat> part of one of them. Um, you can always also call Chagua and Maule, uh, also really good areas. So um, again, I'll, I'll ping these over in the email tomorrow. But if you are looking for sort of finer styles of Bordeaux, call Chagua, Maipo and Maule are your bets. Uh, fun story about Merlot. In 1994, after, um, oops, sorry, I'm just struggling to stop share again. In 1994, um, after a lot of Merlot was being sold from Chile and very popular, uh, there was a discovery that most of it, or a large portion of it, was actually a, another variety called Carmenere. Um, and that was accidentally cuttings brought over from the 1800s. Carmenere is actually a Bordeaux variety. Um, so understandable that some cuttings got mixed up on a boat in the 1800s. Um, but now um, Merlot has been properly defined. You're not getting Carmenere, although Carmenere is delicious, um, but you're certainly getting exactly what you pay for. You're getting exactly what you, you've asked for. So there's no more Merlot Carmenere confusion. And it does mean that real Merlot, proper Merlot today, is actually the third most planted variety in Chile. So this particular wine, I mentioned the ridiculous price point already, $5.95. Um, it's got some gorgeous Mediterranean soils on that central valley. So um, I mentioned earlier about Merlot wanting a little bit of warmth, and this really can do it. It allows sort of large amounts of grapes to ripen fully. So actually, it's a really great source of affordable Merlot because you can get that really good value on scale. Um, it's made in the southern part of the valley, so it's slightly cooler because we're moving away from the equator if we're going south on the southern hemisphere. Um, but it's friendly, it's affordable. For me, it's possibly a bit more red fruited than the one before. It's definitely not as herbaceous. If you are tasting along, I'm keen to know what you think. For me, definitely not as herbaceous as the first, perhaps a bit more simple, just fruit forward rather than, um, rather than that little extra complexity. Um, but not doing it too much disservice. It's also two years younger. So we wouldn't we wouldn't expect 2020 Julian Merlot to have development or be any any sort of earthiness, but it does what it says on the tin. Very friendly. And I'm going to give this one a taste because um, I think this has got a really lovely structure for a wine of $5.95. So yeah, do taste along with me. Hmm. 
friendly. You've still got those sort of plush tannins, but they're not coating your mouth too much. There's a lovely refreshing acidity. And yeah, lots of red fruits. I actually get a bit more red currant on the on the palate as well, which is uh, lovely. It's got this sort of zinginess, perhaps, that you tend not to get in, in, a, in a Bordeaux, but that's not, not meant as a negative. It's just um, a fact of life. It's a sort of fruit forward, friendly wine. Would go really well with a barbecue, in my opinion. One that I'm... Um, I must confess, I've had had many a barbecue, uh, but it's a really pleasant, um, crowd pleasing wine. So, uh, yes, like I said, Chile is. If you're really looking for affordability on Merlot, then Chile has to be the place that you go. Um, but that being said, our last wine that we are going to move on to, and we have done a bit of a whistle stop tour, so apologies as always. Um, but I want to leave some time for questions, unlike my rambling last week. Um, but the last wine that I'm going to talk about and region I'm going to talk about has a really fun story to go with it. So I want to want to make sure we have time. Uh, the um, There is a lot of Merlot grown in California, but considerably less than they used to be. And I'll tell you why. But it's not the only state that grows Merlot in the USA. Um, Washington state is also incredibly good at growing Merlot. Um, and again, I'm just going to quickly zoom pardon me so you've got california here which we are going to go on to and talk about oregon doesn't really grow much merlot it's found its heart with pinot and it can earn producers can earn a decent buck so they wouldn't expect it but funnily enough in this area up here at washington there is some incredible merlot being grown and particularly around the columbia valley and it's sunny there's a lot of sunshine. I think there's a strange statistic that there's more sunshine hours. Yes, there are more sunshine hours in Washington State than there are in California. Um, it's to do with latitude and, and clouds and, and whatnot. But um, there's a lot of sunshine, but it's also this lovely cooling um, sort of influence in the evenings. And it means that you can preserve the acidity. And sometimes Merlot can have a little bit of a problem in terms of keeping its acidity down. And it, at worst case, that can make Merlot a bit flabby. And it's a strange word, but it just means it's not really refreshing and pleasant and it's a bit, ugh. And so Washington State's fabulous. We do sell a particularly good one, and I will mention it from Milbrook Valley, um and it's worth looking out for we don't have any at the moment but it's one of my go-to wines it's about 13 pounds um and i love it and nobody believes it's merlot because everybody it's made in a sort of amazing cabernet sauvignon style and everyone expects it to be cabernet but it's not and it's merlot and i love that trick um but yes moving down into california there are plenty of affordable styles in california and those tend to be grown um along the sort of valleys and our wine here is actually a blend of a few different valleys and some more expensive regions. Um, but you can find some fancier, should we say, uh, Merlot. Uh, and if it's grown in all the places you'd expect it to be grown for fancy California. Napa, Sonoma, uh, Monterey County. So all of those names you've probably heard before about top quality American wines. Um, and yes, it is grown there, but it is usually blended there. Um, you're often you're not often getting 100% Merlots. There are some exceptions. Uh, we we sadly don't sell any at the moment, but I know that Sarah's always on the lookout. Um, but there are a few there are a few sort of top names that really focus on Merlot. Um, but I will tell you one quick story about the the Merlot grape variety. I don't know whether anyone's seen Sideways, the 2004 film. Can I have a raise of hands if you have? Yes. So on my screen, I'm getting about 50 percent. So for those non-screeners, I'm hoping it's a few of you have. Um, I didn't mention it last week, but uh, Sideways was a film, sort of a, it's not a coming of age film, but two, two gents go on a road trip around California and one's a wine snob and one's a wine novice. Um, and it's, it's not strictly about wine, but certainly the, the subtext is all wine. And one of the characters uh, is very disparaging on Merlot and describes people like great varieties and essentially really laid into Merlot as being sort of the everyday boring, not very interesting. All the stuff I said was incorrect at the beginning. Um, and the main reason is that in, you know, in the 90s, a lot of that sort of wine, that sort of Merlot was being produced in the US and they had a bit of a glut of it. And 
And as a complete polar reaction, he described Pinot beautifully. Uh, the Pinot, sales of Pinot, I know, went up over 20% year on year after the film Sideways came out. It got this sort of cult following. And Merlot sales did actually drop. And there's lots of stories of producers ripping up their Merlot vines because they couldn't sell as much as they used to. So um, I find that really sad because hopefully you're about to see that Merlot can provide a really, really affordable, drinkable, lovely wine from the US that doesn't have to break the bank for being packing a huge amount of punch for, for what it does. So sideways aside, because yes, I'm sideways aside because I'm sad about the uh, the Merlot battering. But this particular wine is from Bogle. Um, they were started in the 1960s. Um, they have vineyard, this particular wine, sorry, was from um, M- Monterey, I mentioned, um, and also Lodi and Clarksburg. So there's, oh, I think I've got something drawing, but it doesn't matter. Um, and it is oaked. This has seen um, American oak for 12 months. So this is our really oaky, oaky version of Merlot that I'm really keen to share with you. And bear with me, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So in terms of colour, it is older than the Chilean. Chilean? (laughs) That's what the Americans call it, Chilean. Uh, It's got a little bit more of a rusty red colour that we might expect from a slightly older wine. But the main thing that really jumps out the glass to me is that lovely oak influence that was just on one side of the screen when I first got those uh, images up at the beginning. It's vanilla, it's chocolate, it's mocha, it's coffee. Um, Merlot has really taken this sort of beautiful, sweet almost, it smells like sweet baking spices and it's really taken them on um, in the most gorgeous way. And I think the nice thing here, I mentioned this supple tannins at the beginning, and I think this is a good opportunity to, to see where the oak and the supple tannins can really work really, really beautifully. So I'm going to take a sip. Yeah, it's so lovely. It's sort of soft, velvety, luscious, really um. I'm going back to Grenache again, but my colleague Emma uh, Briffitt calls Grenache a cookie monster cuddle. And I feel a bit like this about Merlot. Um, It's a really sort of yummy, gorgeous, cuddly, fireside, winter warmer, has to make you smile sort of wine. Um, And this oak integration is absolutely gorgeous because it's definitely not sticking out. And it's, yeah, just a very, very friendly wine. Um, so that was our real whistle stop tour around, uh, the world, but around three regions that I think are very important for the production of Merlot. So we started obviously in Bordeaux and we then moved into a sort of affordable, um, new world option. And then a place where far more expensive, uh, new world options are common, but where you can still find some lovely, um, affordable uh, Merlot being produced, possibly because it's had its, um, yeah, possibly because it's had its rep knocked a bit. So we have had a couple of questions. I will go through as many as I can in our final five minutes. Uh, We've had the first one, and I apologize for missing it earlier. I was, I could have jumped back in, but uh, Peter Cousins has said uh, that he had the full bottle of Chateau Bel Air. Um, Would you expect much difference due to bottle size? It's a great question. Uh, What tends to happen with smaller versus larger bottles? I'm also the worst scientist, so please excuse any language that I use that is incorrect. Um, But essentially, you you have your cork in the bottle. You have less wine having... Um impacted having been impacted by the cork so the smaller surface area of the wine tends to mean that smaller bottles age more quickly Uh, if you imagine the same amount of oxygen is getting in because the cork's the same size but less wine to cork ratio so yes a smaller bottle of anything will age faster i think when we're talking about 2018 you'd be quite surprised to see a huge difference 
Um, if we were talking about a 2018 small bottle versus a 2018 magnum, then I think probably that that might be more the case. But a small bottle versus a full bottle of the of of a, a three four year old wine is not gonna not gonna make too much difference. You really start to see changes kind of five, six, seven years on. And then you can, it's a really fun experiment. You can see which ones age faster and invariably it will be the bottle. Um, but small bottles don't, don't store well on my wine rack. So I don't make a habit of buying them. <laughs> I probably should. Um, they'd make tastings and events much easier. And quite frankly, not enough people make small bottles. It's a real gripe the tastings team have. We'd love to do events just with small bottles. Um, but yes, uh, not always possible. Um, from Claire, why is the Bordeaux blend not as common in the IGP pay stock? There seems to be a lot of Merlot varietal in the South. Um, good question, Claire. And I'm going to sound disparaging, although I, I would rather not. Um, you see a lot of IGP Merlot, in, particularly in the South, um, unclassified where it's very, very easy to grow. And you can make, um, Merlot's a really great um, travel wine. So for aeroplanes, they do lots of studies about which wines work well when you're out uh, in the air. And Merlot is one of those varieties. You actually don't want it to be too punchy for most people. So um, one reason you see a lot of IGP wine down there or unclassified wine is because it's going into this sort of generic blend. Um, that is great for the consumer because it keeps costs down. Um, they also might just be breaking a few rules. So um, you'll see sort of IGP when it could have been a region just because they want to use Merlot alone, because perhaps Merlot's done better that year. Um, but you're quite right. Less, I, I hasten to say less Bordeaux blends. It's just often that the Bordeaux blends will probably be fitting into the regulations of an AOC. Um, very few AOCs in the world have 100% Merlot as a rule that you're allowed to do. New World, ignore because they do it. They make their own rules. Um, but very few places in France or, or Europe have a have the allowance to make 100% Merlot and then put an AOC or a regional designation on it. So the way producers get around making 100% Merlot is by declassifying it. Doesn't mean the grapes are any worse um, and calling it IGP. Um, an example to give you here in the Rhone, if, if suddenly Mer somebody found a fantastic spot for Merlot, um, there are some, I should say, on, on Mont Bon too, they're starting to experiment with it a bit. But say uh, right here in, in Gigondas or down the road, um, somebody found a great spot for Merlot, they wouldn't be able to call it a Gigondas, they wouldn't be able to classify it or a Chateau Neuf de Pape because it doesn't fit the rules. So even though the grapes come from here, they can declassify it down to IGP and it allows them to be a bit more flexible. So that's why. Um, does the wine, uh, sorry, Andrew Farrow has asked, does the Wine Society have any super Tuscans? Uh, do you know what? Not to my knowledge, but that's not to say we haven't or we won't. When I looked, we didn't. Um, however, the... Um, Sarah, Sarah Knowles and her predecessor, Sebastian Payne, both MWs, both have a very similar view, which is that the, the grapes of Italy should be celebrated. And there's quite a few people that think a super Tuscan is not a proper celebration of Italian grapes. Um, I mean, Sarah often says there's enough Cabernets and Merlots in the world. We don't need any more. So she does tend to avoid buying French varietals grown in Italy. Um, but I think when the right one comes along, and it maybe will, then um, no doubt we will get some because they are fantastic. They're, but like I said, they are just very pricey. Um, Beth, food pairings for Merlot. Um, oh, gosh. OK. Um, I'll probably finish on this one. It might take me to the end. Um, the, it really depends on the style. So I mentioned at the beginning, one of the classic combinations for Bordeaux is a Sunday roast. Um, and I like to often think that, that a claret, as it can be called, a red Bordeaux, um, can add some things that you would have added to meat or nut roast, whatever it might be. So I mentioned at the beginning those herbs, thyme, often some sort of dried rosemary. Um, if you think about that and then you think about sort of 
blackcurrant jelly, uh, all of those things. It, for me, that goes with roast in particular. I do like Bordeaux with lamb. A lot of people like roast beef and Bordeaux, but my, my preference is lamb. Um, likewise, for that reason, a lot of grilled vegetables that are made in a Mediterranean style with herbs on them can also go with those sort of more herbaceous styles. I'm thinking off the top of my head, something like an aubergine parmigiana. Um, obviously, that's Italian and we're talking about uh, <laughs> French wine here, but, but something herby and that kind of aubergine smokiness as well. Uh, the central wine, the, the light and fruity Merlot that was very fruit forward, I would definitely say is, um, for me, a much better um, fit with something like a barbecue where you have um, a lot of flavours going on at once and you sort of want a wine that does a bit of everything for, for nothing. It's just friendly, fruity and really, really pleasant. Um, you could also easily drink that in the garden or as an aperitif. Also, I'd go as far as to say with salmon, but um, not smoked salmon. I'd say sort of a roast salmon, particularly in the tomato sauce might be quite nice because there was a bit of acid there. Um, but a, a nice Merlot with, with a lovely salmon fillet is gorgeous. And then lastly, with the bogle, because of that sort of exuberant, lovely oak and sweetness, I think you can probably go a bit bolder on the flavours. So I'd be more going into my stews, my casseroles, um, things with beans, cassoulet, all of those sorts of things you can ramp up a bit. But quite frankly, a, a, big, a big hearty steak as well would be really delicious with something like that. Um, so yes, the world's a little bit your oyster with Merlot, although oysters would be a terrible choice, <laughs> but the world is your oyster. If you stick to sort of a bit more protein and certainly, um, if the wine is herbaceous, I tend to like to pair it with herbaceous things. Um, and then you quite frankly can't go wrong with a nice piece of cheddar at the end of the night. Um, Merlot does have that lovely quality of, of going really nicely with a not too strong cheddar, quite a mild cheddar, um, just in front of the TV. Um, lovely. So I have run over. I always do. Um, I've got one more question that I won't dwell on too much because I don't know the answer, but it's from Tom Bexton saying, uh, I've heard that Merlot is grown in England. Is that true? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I have never seen nor tasted Tom a Merlot grown in England. Uh, unlike the, the ability to answer that question last week with Pino saying yes and the Essex Pino is on the up. I can't guarantee that Essex Merlot is on the up. I suspect we're not quite warm enough yet. So I think it will be a little while before we're growing some, some top quality Merlot by any stretch. If we're growing it, I'm not sure what sort of, uh, what sort of thing we'll be looking at. But hey, you never know, somebody might be doing it in a nice little warm spot somewhere. And certainly in the years to come with climate change, you just can't rule it out. So there we go. Anywho, um, I'm absolutely delighted you could all join me again for those who were here last week. For those who've, of you who've just joined Sip Size for the first time, I hope this was a nice introduction and that you'll continue to uh, join in on future events. We do have most of, I think we've got all of October already up. Uh, some of November and the wines are going to start to go up this week for uh, they'll probably go up on Friday for the latter part of those online, which I believe is uh, Loire, uh, red wines of the Loire and then also an intro to Bordeaux. So if you liked Merlot, come join us for Cabernet and then you can build on all of it by coming to join us for the intro to Bordeaux. That's how we hope they're going to work. Nice little building blocks that you can keep uh, keep coming back to. So. Without further ado, I'm going to snuggle up on the sofa. I think I'm going to watch a, the rerun of Strictly that I missed with my very hearty and very warming Vogel. I hope you all have a lovely rest of your evening. And hopefully I'll see you again next Tuesday, if not before, because we do have two events, uh, one tomorrow on Aussie Shiraz and then another food and wine event on Thursday. So, yeah, I've just seen I'm fully Merlot'd up now. Absolutely, me too. So <laughs> have a lovely evening all and hopefully see you next week. Cheers. <laughs>